Mary Harris. My name's Jeff Stanley, and I'm going to play a Deb Talent song for you called I Wake in Joy. Camilla, greetings. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. When you ask someone when was the last time they've studied the Ten Commandments, most likely they'll say it was when they were children. If you attended Sunday school, confirmation class, or vacation Bible school, you probably studied Exodus 20 at some point. Sometimes children get them confused in funny ways, like the child who said the seventh commandment read, thou shalt not admit adultery. Honestly, the commandments are beyond children, the concepts of idolatry and adultery and keeping the Sabbath. The Ten Commandments are meant for adults. Remember the setting. It's spelled out in that first line of our reading. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. 
The Israelites had been liberated from their oppression and were brought into the wilderness where they wandered for a generation before entering the promised land. And during that time, they tried to rid themselves of a slave's mentality and to live as freed people. And that was the point of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were given to the Israelites and us as a way of saying, this is what freedom looks like. It's also a way of saying, this is how we live in community. The two go hand in hand, freedom and community. None of us are free when we are isolated. We are created to be in community. We are, at our core, social creatures. And freedom involves being in relationship with one another and with God. When my children were young, uh, we lived in a neighborhood that was crime-ridden. Prostitutes walked the street, drug addicts were shooting up in the property, wooded property behind our home. Uh, twice our house was burglarized. We weren't free. Nobody who lived on that street were free. We were afraid to go out for a walk at night or to have our children in the playground to answer the front door, or to leave our house for more than a few hours because we were afraid someone would break into it. After only two years we moved, it was no way to live. We were held captive. Well, the Ten Commandments are rules on how to live in freedom, and living in freedom, how we live in community. They really are a chance to talk about the goodness of God. They're not meant as punishment but as a gracious way of life. Depending upon how you number the Ten Commandments, the first two or three focus on how we relate to God, and the next six or seven on how we relate to one another. That first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me, is meant to free us from the continuous fatigue and disappointments of our idolatries. We chase after money, possessions, careers. Sometimes we chase after people, idolizing them, and we find ourselves enslaved. I recall having a conversation with a couple who owned a restaurant. How long have you owned the restaurant, I asked them. The wife turned to her husband while she spoke to me. We don't own the restaurant, she said. It owns us. It was clear she wanted freedom. It began as a noble dream, but in time it became their master. The third commandment, which is in regard to keeping the Sabbath, has more printed space than any of the others, but remember the context. The Hebrew people, the Israelites, had been slaves. And being slaves, they never had a day off. They didn't have the word vacation in their vocabulary. Their value as human beings was measured by how many bricks they made. In this commandment, God says, take a day off. As a matter of fact, I command you to take off a day. Take a day off and don't worry about tomorrow. Enjoy your family. Enjoy friends and the creation. You are now free people. So the Ten Commandments were actually meant as a gift to us. They set boundaries for us. Yes, they are the do's and don'ts, but they are the do's and don'ts that liberate us. As I said, they are God's gracious gift. The last, well, the next seven commandments are in regards of how we live in community. This is especially an important lesson in the times we live. We live in a culture that is highly individualistic. But what does it mean to live together and care for each other? I mean, it's not just about you and it's not just about me. It's about being in relationship with others. And in those relationships, well, accountability and responsibility are involved. The commandments answer the question, how am I going to tend to my neighbor? Will I wear a mask when I'm out in public? Or will I protest with the argument that it infringes on my personal rights? In an interview with Dr. Tom Friedman, former director of the CDC, he describes contact 
tracing in a way that well, could be understood as good theology. He says contact tracing may not be the best term because it sounds like someone is snooping. But really, what it is about is care for one another. It is warning others that have been in close contact with someone who has the virus that while I may be asymptomatic, I could be passing on the disease to someone else, to a neighbor, and then you pass it on to another neighbor for whom it will be dangerous. And so we go out of our way and quarantine ourselves even while we might feel fine. And we do this for someone in the community we have never met. That's a beloved community. That is a reflection of the goodness of God. And that is what the scriptures are getting at with the Ten Commandments. The care for each other, the do's and don'ts, the boundaries that keep us safe. And by community, the Bible doesn't mean just people whose names you know, the people in your office at work or in your congregation or the people who live on the street in your neighborhood. But community includes the cashier at the grocery store whose name you don't know or the woman who pumps your gas who you'll never meet again. Our understanding of community is as wide as Jesus' understanding of who's considered a neighbor. The Judeo-Christian understanding of personhood is not concentrated on the solitary individual, that rugged individualism. That's just not part of the biblical story. Rather, I am known and judged and how I relate to others and God. And how I tend to my neighbor is a direct expression of how I relate to God. It's all wound together. Once again, the commandments are what a free and healthy community looks like. Honor your elder, which would be your father or mother, your grandparents, or the elderly person that lives next door. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover, covet. They are the basics, and from there it sets the tone of how we should treat each other. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus takes the commandments, these commandments, and goes to the heart of the matter. Murder isn't just killing someone, but ruining another person's character. Adultery, he says, is a matter of the heart before action is taken. When we read the early history of the Methodist movement, John Wesley can sound terribly harsh to our modern ears. The early Methodists were organized around small accountability groups, usually about 12 people, and they were called society. Society is a word that was used differently in the 1700s than it is now. But it was a, a fellowship, these societies, a way for people to belong. Wesley was known to visit a town and weed out people from the society. He would call them on ruly walkers. In one visit to a town in Britain, Newcastle, he expelled 64 members from the societies, saying that um, their expulsions were for lightlessness and carelessness. Many were expelled for drunkenness, others for railing, quarreling, swearing, habitual lying, one for wife-beating, another for laziness. The Methodist movement took hold at a time when the British society was in chaos. And historians believe that had it not been for the Methodists, the country would have gone the way of the French and been in a violent revolution. Well, the industrial revolution had displaced families from rural areas and cramped them in inner cities where the housing was overcrowded and, well, unsanitary. Working conditions were dangerous, wages not self-sustaining, crime, alcoholism, poverty, family abuse was rampant, gangs roamed the streets. In order to transform society and make the church well of relevant and worth its effort, he believed there needed to be accountability. There had to be accountability within government and the church 
but also, but there had to be, excuse me, accountability among government and within the church. Folks, he believed, had to live in harmony with one another and God. And for that reason, he required that the Methodists toe the line. And the movement grew. Something was expected of them. Something was required. And in that requirement, it was a gracious act. I think of the Ten Commandments in that way. I'm not a mind that, of a mind that I would throw somebody out of the church for breaking them. Then we'd all be out. But they are a way of saying, hey, folks, this is what is expected of us. This is how we live free lives. It reminds me of a visit to Jamaica with a United Methodist volunteer and mission team. Jamaica has a terrible problem with street drugs and crime. I was with a group of volunteers helping to build a school that was tied to a Methodist church that was on the front lines of the battle against street drugs. While our team was at the church, a young Jamaican man showed up terribly high on drugs. Coming down after that high, he was rail thin and underfed. He looked terrible. The pastor of the church sat with that young man while he ate. I gathered they knew each other and that he had a tie to the congregation, attended at one time. Women brought him food and he ate till he was full. And when he was finished eating, that pastor spoke to that young man like an angry, disappointed father with his child. He told them that this was never to happen again. He told them he would give him the help he needed, but he had to show up and receive the help. He told him that in no uncertain terms, more was expected of him. He disciplined this young man until finally the fellow broke down and began to cry. Then the pastor held him and wiped away his tears. And I understand they sat together for the rest of the day. There's something to be learned in this story. This combination of grace and accountability. It is God's gracious law. It's meant to set us free. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. I'm Don Davis. Here is the reading of the Lord's Prayer. Our Creator in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us bread for our needs from day to day, and forgive us our offenses, as we have forgiven our offenders. And do not let us enter into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I'm Cindy McDonald. We're doing He Leadeth Me.
I have Diana and yes. Bob uh, with me today, and each week we're discovering what folks in our congregation are learning during this time of the pandemic and the wildfires that have rushed through Oregon. What lessons have we learned and what keeps us, what keeps our spirits up? So, Diane and Bob, what, what have you learned during this time of the pandemic about each other, about the world, about yourselves? That we get along pretty well. <laughs> we always have, though, about well, being together all the time and not having a lot of other people around being you. Being together more, more than, oh, yeah. than yes. before because yes. you're inside a lot more. Yeah. And with the smoke and everything, that's another factor of being inside more. So you've learned that you have a beautiful relationship. Oh yes, we, oh, yeah. get, we get along pretty well. What we do you have... attribute that to? What, what can you tell people about what makes for I would a think good relationship? I would say he's got a per good personality. Um, he's, he's a sweet person usually. He's pretty mellow. I'm more hyper, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's sweet and more outspoken. <laughs> yes, that's it. I'm sweet and more outspoken. That's a very nice way of saying <laughs> it. <laughs> No, he's a keeper, as I was told in the beginning. Charlotte and Ed actually are the ones that, well, Charlotte are the ones that introduced us. And so that's how we got to know each other, through and, church, through and church. It's, it's been mostly all bliss ever since? Most of the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah when, when, we, when we met, the, the church had a group that met once a month And got for to dinner. dinner. We went out to dinner the together. Friendship dinner, sort of. And we went out to a restaurant and ate and... Bob, you worked for years here at the church, am I correct? I did. Can you tell us what you did? I was a lead custodian for for eight and a half years. Uh, that involved ge just all general cleanup and maintenance. Right. Well, what uh, can you, and other things. What can you What can you tell us? What can you tell other couples? You think is the key to an enduring healthy, good relationship? I guess, well, like I was always told, don't ever go to bed mad for one thing. Okay. But I was gonna say, I think just listening to the person and cooling, if, sometimes if you get upset about something, just go off for a few minutes and rethink and it's okay. It, it works out. Usually you just, you can't hold those kind of grudges. You just have to let them pass. Keeping an open mind. Right. Keeping and an open mind. Just uh, following all in the, the Bible golden readings. Rules. <laughs> well, well, thank you. Thanks to both of you. <laughs> to all that we'll say, amen. 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 <laughs> I encourage your generosity with First United Methodist Church of Medford. During these times of pandemic, when we are not meeting for in-person worship, you can give online through our website. You can give simply by mailing a check or bringing your offering to the church. We continue our ministry. We are currently working with the United Methodist Committee on Relief, providing health kits, education kits, and hygiene kits uh, for area victims of the fire. To sign up to be a part of this relief effort, you'll notice a link that was sent with this worship service on your email inbox. Just click that link and a calendar will be given to you with instructions of how you can help out and volunteer. Remember, we will be doing worship in our parking lot on the last two weekends of October, October 18th and the 25th. I hope you'll join us. These services will, all, will also be posted on Facebook Live and then later posted to YouTube. First United Methodist Church continues its ministry. Good morning, I'm Barb Geisler, and let us pray together the prayer of illumination. Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, and in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Hi, I'm Bob Covey. I'm Diana Ayanora. And what passage will you be reading to us? We'll be reading a passage from Exodus chapter 20. Go ahead. And, uh, and God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which 
have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any given, graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Okay, I'm reading 12 through 20. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us and we will here, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is, is come to prove you, and that this fear may be before your faces, that ye not sin not. Let us prepare our hearts to pray by taking a moment of silence. Let us pray. Lord, awaken us to your glory. Open our eyes to your presence. Open our ears to your call. Open our hearts to your love. That we may proclaim, may proclaim that you are among us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray for the leaders of our nations, especially for the leaders of this nation, we pray for elected officials, that they may be servant leaders, working for the welfare of the common good and remembering the least among us. We pray for our nation and its democracy, for our peaceful participation in expressing our grievances and for our process of voting and election. Keep us a peaceful people. Good and gracious God, we pray for creation and its restoration. Teach us to be good stewards of our waters, skies, and forests. Call us forth to be with those whose lives and homes and businesses have been ravaged by fire. Teach us the way to their restoration. Wise and gracious God, we need you and one another in these difficult times. Help us to look beyond our differences in politics, income, or race to what we share and hold in common, to love and to need love, and the desires for our children and a better future. Healer and Redeemer, give us stamina and the will to feed the hungry, to house the displaced, to clothe the poor, and to heal the brokenhearted. 
and for those in our circle of care, for all who suffer of body, mind, and spirit, and for all who watch over them. We give you thanks, even when life is difficult for your many blessings. For babies born, for recovery from illness, for the beauty of creation that greets us each morning, and for friends and family that give our lives joy and meaning. And finally, we pray for this church, First United Methodist of Medford. It is your church. Guide our lives and send us out that we would be the gospel message, that we would be good news for the world. Amen. Okay. Was that okay? All right, the next one we're going to do today is a modern hymn by Stuart Townsend called How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
from his reward. I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have been my You. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. All right, this uh, piece is entitled Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness. Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness, blow through the wilderness, calling and free. Spirit, Spirit of Restlessness, turn me from placidness, wind on the sea You moved on the waters You called to the deep Then you coaxed up the mountains From the valleys of sleep And over the eons You called to each thing Awake from your slumber